Jeremiah currently serves as the pastor at Scotts Valley Covenant Church um, in Scotts Valley, California, obviously. And this morning, we are pulpit swapping. Yes, we so, are. So as of this moment, Pastor Amanda is probably wrapping up, wrapping up her yep. message at, at Scotts Valley, and yep. Jeremiah is starting his message yes. now. And so, could we just praise God and thank God for Jeremiah and just give him a, a little, our, give him our love this morning. Jeremiah, we're glad Good you're morning. here. Thanks, brother. Thank you, sir. Love you, sir. Good morning. We've, we've been talking about this for like four years. We have. Mostly just so Greg could go to Santa Cruz, I think, <laughs> and I could come visit family. It's, it's really selfish. Again, my name is Jeremiah Fair. I was the lead pastor at uh, Crossroads. I was every pastor at Crossroads Church throughout my time there, but I ended up as lead pastor there before Lee Towns has taken over. Um, and I love Turlock. I love this community. I love this family. Um, I don't know if for you, for me, my faith experience tends to be mostly an intellectual one. I really engage with God through reading, through study. I love a library. I read a poster once that said, paradise one day will be a lot like a library. Many of you cringe at that. I find life in that. Old smelly books, I smell them. I'm the guy that goes, <sighs> I worked at Borders here for years. <sighs> Bless Borders. Uh, I worked at Borders here for years. I helped open the store. I would walk around and smell the books. I love books and information and knowledge. And I tend to have this way. This is the way I have done for 40 years. This is how I engage with God. I experience God through intellect. And it's taken me almost 40 years to realize there's these things called, I don't know if you've heard of them, they're called emotions or feelings, ugh. and people experience God through them, which is shocking to me. I had a friend of mine, his name is Jeremy. He actually just moved over to Santa Cruz to take another church, but he ran Chi Alpha here at the university for almost 15 years. We were great friends. He's from Assemblies of God, which is a much different tradition than I'm used to, and he would tell me about his feelings around the Holy Spirit and God, and I was very uncomfortable. And if I want to be honest with you, I was very judgmental. And let me tell you why. Because there was no way Jeremy had as rich of an experience of God as I did. Truly. There was no way, because of my rich intellectual history, I enjoyed reading. Emotions were fine, but I knew how you experienced God, and it was through the intellect. I knew how, and I note to self, most Swedes, of which I am one, are terrified of deep feelings. Forget that. Um, I just knew this is how God was to be experienced. This is how we're supposed to do this. And I couldn't imagine someone having a full life with God without this intellectual experience. And then I think of this when I visit my friends, my grandmother who just passed away with dementia. I think of this bias being exposed as I, have, I did a baptism this week for a severely autistic kid who was 10 years old and his mom was forced to put him in a home because he was too violent. And this bias comes out to say, really, really, you're the one? They don't have any rich experience with God because they can't read a book? Of course, this is garbage. But I come into you and I reveal to you my bias. I reveal to you the bias that I have that there's a particular way we experience God intellectually. And I think a lot of us might walk into this. And I know it's stupid. I know it's garbage. But in reality, I participate in it all the time. I'm always catching my own bias. I, I, by the way, I think we run on the same bias. You do realize the heart of our church is a half-hour lecture. We are clear on that. At the heart, imagine this this morning, if Greg went through all the service and he ended it, you would be very mad. Where was the sermon, Greg? Has you ever done that? And next note to self, it may be coming. Where was the sermon, Greg? I skipped one once. We had a testimony go along for a mom in our church, and I skipped my sermon. People said, thank you for not dragging out the service. So my church is a little different. But I appreciate it. It felt wrong. Like, we have to have a sermon. This is our bias. At the center of our religious experience is this intellectual experience. Now, this is our tradition. I think it's fine. But we have to realize as covenanters, we sit in the middle of many traditions, and we celebrate them all. I don't know if you know that. We enjoy the many different traditions. And this morning, I wanted to dive into a deeper way that Jesus revealed these kind of biases through a particular, um, through a particular parable this morning. Um, I do not study the Bible lightly, ever. However, Jesus' stories I approach with nervousness, trepidation, fear, anxiety sometimes. I have never come out on the other side of a Jesus story the same person. I have never come out from the other side of a parable Jesus told me, if I have spent time on it, I get converted again and again. Thank God God does not leave us by ourselves. Oh, you're converted, you're good, I'm going to move on. No, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
Our lives will be many, many conversions, my friends. And I'm thankful that God does this for me. I love Jesus' stories because when Jesus tells a story, I tend to lean in a little bit. I lean in. What is he going to say? I've heard this story before. It doesn't matter. Every time I read the Bible, it reads me back. And the Jesus of the Bible, through the Spirit, begins to show me who I am and reveal bias. Richard Rohr once said, was asked, who is God for you? And he says, Jesus Christ is the human face of God. And without Jesus Christ, I would have never believed in God. I agree. I agree. At the heart, I'm a Jesus follower, and I'm an atheist, my friends. I don't find other religions particularly interesting. I find Jesus Christ fascinating. So we engage with Jesus this morning. We're going to hear a Jesus story. I'm so thrilled you're doing parables all summer because they're confusing and they ruin our lives and they're awesome. So we're going to dive into this. For me, parables, and this is for me, if I contradict anything Greg or Amanda have said, just go with them, okay? Uh, but for me, <laughs> for me, a parable uh, were these small stories that could change, alter reality. They were small stories Jesus would tell, and they would slightly adjust the people listening to them toward the way of the kingdom of God or the way God saw the world. Um, I, I, I don't think of them as having a singular meaning or moral. Like, here's this parable, don't be a jerk. Okay, let's move on. I don't think that's how they work. I also don't think they're allegories where they represent a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God all the time and with people. I think Jesus was telling stories from everyday people's lives to adjust our stories just a little bit. And because at the bottom of ourselves, we tell stories about ourselves. We tell stories about our communities. We have a story about Turlock and about California and as Americans. And Jesus would tell his own stories, and his stories were like an off note from ours. And you're like, that's not quite right, is it? Blessed are the poor? That's not how this works. Woe to the rich? That's definitely not how our world works. And he would just go like this, boop. He would slightly convert us. And for 2,000 years, there's never been a single human culture that's gone, we, we nail on this Jesus thing. We got it. None of us have. Jesus' stories always tweak us, always convert us, always change the deep stories we're telling. And so this morning, I hope this changes our deep stories as it has changed mine and will continue to. And by the way, it is amazing, 2,000 years later, we still tell these stories. We gather around, because this is the church, right? We gather to hear from Jesus. We gather to hear from Jesus and to be healed. This is what we're doing here. If this isn't why you're here, it's why you're here. Welcome. Let's pray before I read our scripture this morning. Father, these are your words. They are so special to us. May they change us. May we be different people. May all of us convert to a new story this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14, says this. He, being Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were more righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you, I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. It says he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. You know, with this intro, you might as well put my picture up. I don't know why Jesus can't ever start a parable. This parable is for people who are vegan and love rock climbing. I'm out. I'm out. This parable is for people who think Lord of the Rings movies are better than Star Wars. Wrong? This parable is for people who love LeBron James. I'm out. I don't like any of those things. I wish there was just one parable that didn't apply to me. I wish there was one parable where God's like, oh, this one's not mine. Skip. I'm awesome. I can move on from this one. Those who see themselves as self-righteous and others with contempt, yeah, and every time I don't think I think that way, I drive to Turlock from the Bay Area, and it's just contempt for all my other drivers, everybody, just utter contempt. <laughs> yes. Already this is me, and let's be honest, it's all of us. I mean, we could deny it, right? But I mean, come on, this is many of us sitting in this room. We, how about this? Self-righteousness means this. They trusted in themselves and their correct opinions and their correct behavior, that that was the way to live. And by the way, that's everybody. Liberal, conservative, I don't care. 
They trusted that they had the right views of personal morality, and they trusted they had the right views of social morality, and that's what was getting them by. They, had, they trusted they had the right behavior toward people of other ethnic groups, and they trusted they had the right behavior internally toward their spouse, and that's what they trusted in. That's what was getting them by. That's self-righteousness. Welcome. Welcome all to self-righteousness. And the nice thing in this room, you can look around, everybody does this. Welcome. We can all approach this parable knowing you're me and I'm you, and none of us have to feel better than anybody else. We are who Jesus is talking to. They trusted in their deep down, they gave themselves credit, by the way, for their own opinions. So not only did they trust in their own opinions and right action, but they gave themselves credit for those opinions and their right action. They said it was me. I nailed it. This is like the wife who says, I am nailing marriage and forgets there's another half. This is like the lead singer who says, I don't need a band, it's just me. Tom Fogarty, Axl Rose, pick, take your pick. And they move on, and you're like, no, you stink now. You're terrible without Slash, sorry about that. This is what it is, right? This is what, this is what it looks like. And then what you do, this, 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 this is the movement towards self-righteousness. I have the right opinions, I got them myself, no one else helped me, I did this, and now I can stand taller than everyone around me. I may now be higher. I will raise myself. I will enjoy the fruit of my own success in getting here. And by the way, what does Jesus say? The word he says, he looked on others with contempt. The word contempt is to show by one's attitude or manner of treatment that the entity or person has no merit or worth, to have no use for something or someone as being beneath one's consideration, a kind of spiritual indifference. Jesus saves his harshest language, not for anger, but for contempt. He says, yeah, you'll get in trouble if you cuss out your friends, but you call them an idiot, you're going to hell. You're on the road to hell. Because in your heart, you're lowering people and raising yourself. Contempt, Jesus had no time for, and he crushed people with it. He made sure you saw your contempt. By the way, in mercy and love, he did love the Pharisees. They moved through their lives with so much self-righteousness and contempt, he had to crush them just a little bit to get them to where they needed to go. This parable is going to show us all these things, and we're not even in the parable yet. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Now, tax collectors and sinners were a very special group at this time period. We're told that Jesus colluded with both. The fancy word is table fellowship. He means he ate with them. I like that we use table fellowship as a term. He ate dinner with them. It's very simple. He ate with these folks. And by being seen with them, it gave them a kind of, that he was honored to be known among them. Uh, we don't have a lot of folks like this. I was really trying to think through this. Perhaps it'd be if, if, if like one of our presidents was sitting with a bunch of the opposite party at a dinner table and laughing and having a good time, you might go, what on earth? How dare he have friends who disagree with him? We're out. And we don't do this in America anywhere. We might have 20 years ago, but it's kind of a lost thing these days in our community. Both tax collectors and sinners were the, were the scapegoat of the Jews during this time period. Sinners caused the Roman Empire to come and take over and oppress them, is the story they told. Now, this comes from the prophets. The ancient prophets said, why did Babylon come and these other empires and take out the Jewish people about 600 years before this? Why? What happened? Well, the prophets were saying there was sin in the land, and these sinners caused this. Now, the sin then was greed, and the rich oppressing the poor, the prophets tell us. But later, it got changed to basically sexual sin during this time period. And so the Pharisees would teach, the reason the Romans are oppressing us, the reason we got destroyed by the Romans, is because of all these sinners. And it's their fault, not ours. It's their fault we are where we are. We do not eat with these people. It's their fault. And the other were tax collectors, those Jewish people who dared collude with the Roman Empire to collect their taxes. How dare they betray us? And Jesus sat with all of them and had dinner with all of them. But as we tell the parable, when Jesus says this, this is who these people are. They are hated, hated. It is their fault. They represent the Roman Empire, the oppressiveness we're under, the crushed feet we are under. They represent the collusion and the cause all at the same time. And Jesus spent time with the wrong kind of people all the time, all the time. He remember he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit simply means those who have no interest in religion or faith. And he says, I, you can imagine it this way. God has a close relationship with those who would rather stay home and watch football than go to church. That's what it means. Blessed are those who would rather go to family camp than be with their church family this morning. Amen? Gosh, sinners. 
All of them, all 30 of them. <laughs> they can listen to that later. That'll be fun. <laughs> this is what Jesus said. This is how he taught us. But I think there are other groups probably today that we could start to lean into as the parable moves on. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you. I am not like this person. Hear that prayer. I thank you. I am not like them. I thank you that I am not like them. There's this dual isolation. By the way, there's a dual isolation here. There's one person standing by himself, the Pharisee, who is, who is alone, and there is the tax collector who's off hiding alone. These are dual isolation happening, right? And by the way, uh, did the community isolate both those individuals, or did the people? I'm guessing the community actually kind of did. The community told the tax collector, uh, if you could stay in the back. But what did the, where, why is the Pharisee isolated? But why am I? Who's isolated in this room right now? Me. You have let me stand on a stage. I'm already taller than all of you, and I get to be even taller than normal. You've isolated me, and you've set me up higher. This is the Pharisee's position he had all the time. You're a religious teacher. We set you up higher. So there's a dual isolation happening here, which is very important, I think, in this story. And by the way, we, we, who would we say this about? Who is it secretly? If you could go out this week and say, thank God I am not that person, who would you say it about? Who would you say it about? Thank God I'm not an alcoholic. Thank God I don't have special needs. Thank God I'm not gay or lesbian. Thank God I'm not mentally ill. Thank God I'm not divorced. Thank God I'm not unemployed. Shall I go on? Jesus loves us so much. He knew how to reveal our bias. And all he had to do is say, who do you fill in? Thank God I am not. How do you end the sentence? Welcome to your self-righteousness. Welcome to your need for the grace of God. Welcome. Because you're always better than somebody, aren't you? I like to find parents I'm a lot better than all the time. I like to find parents that uh, I'm a pretty bad parent, so I have to find really bad parents. I saw one the other day where a lady left her kid at McDonald's all day so she could go gamble. I was like, there's one. Found one. There's one. And I'm like, why do I do this? Why am I always trying to find someone I'm better than or smarter than or a better parent than? Why is this mechanism in me? Well, Jesus knew we had this mechanism in our genetic brokenness. Note that the Pharisee is not grateful for his experience with God. He's grateful he's not someone else. Notice he's not grateful like, I have known God. I've heard him through the truth of his word. I've experienced him through the temple. This is not what he's saying. He's saying, thank God I'm not something else. Not because God's given him things, but he isn't something else and he's better than. He is thankful against someone else because he cannot imagine them having a rich experience with God. That's what he's doing. He is thankful he's not the sinner because there's no way that person has a rich experience with God. Do you know why covenant membership in most churches is open to all who follow Jesus? Do you know why? Because we say all have a rich experience with God, even if you disagree with him. Well, that person can't. Do they know Jesus? Yes, they probably are. But they're doing, I know. You know what you're doing, by the way? And yet you have a rich experience with God. Amazing. We say people can flourish in a relationship with Christ even if we don't understand how that's possible. Yet we welcome you to our table as members of our communities. We welcome you. And this is what it is to be covenant for me and to do, enjoy this. And again, it doesn't mean we don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean we don't find ways to build community together, but it means sitting in a room together. Gosh, welcome. Welcome those who know Jesus. He says, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of my income. Look at me. By the way, Jesus called them hypocrites, not because they were sinners. They would like go out and like prostitute themselves at night and then go to church in the morning. That's not what they did. They were hypocrites because they filled a role for the role's sake. They were actors. And Jesus says, you just fill the role. You've made the role for yourself. And you're like, this is, what, this is what it looks like to be religious. And if you don't do these things, you're not religious or having a fulfilled life with God. And Jesus said, it's all out the window, folks. Nope. God chooses who he's close to. God chooses who he moves with. It was never you in the first place. You've missed the whole story of 600 years, I told you, of the Old Testament. You've missed it all. This role means, by the way, I appreciate this phrase. The role means we are supposed to do something that a real Christian would do. Imagine that phrase for you. What's a real Christian do? End the sentence. One pastor says, stop saying should. A real Christian should. And what you're doing is you're shoulding all over me. <laughs> you are. 
Keep your shoulds to yourself. There's a reason he only brings me in once every four years, folks. <laughs> you stop it. You don't get to should on me. You don't get to. And I don't get to do it to you. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have standards. It doesn't mean we don't have debates and discussions about the Bible. We are people of the book. We do, my friends. This is what we get to do. But it also means there's a space where Jesus has challenged us to do something else. And this is the big thing. This is the big thing. There are no normative or normal Christian experiences. There are no normative or normal Christian experiences. All you have to do is look at the broad way that Christianity has splintered itself into so many different ways of interacting with different cultures. Now, there can be boundaries again, but there's no normal. This experience would be, seem strange to many, my friends. It would seem strange to many. My grandmother, who passed away with dementia, she had three years just down the road at Covenant Village, had a deep, meaningful experience with God in ways I will never understand. Was it normative? Not at all. Not at all, my friends. Was it normal in the least? And yet, I have come to the life where God has broken me enough and converted me to say something was happening. Something was happening in her that I do not understand because it came from God, not from her. Our friends with disabilities, our friends who are unemployed, our friends who are alcoholics, our friends who are gay and lesbian, they're having rich experiences with God. They aren't your experiences, I understand, because it's not from them, it's from God. This whole story was God reaching out to us. This is the story we've been telling for a very long time. You're being converted and saved and made righteous with and through other people. Period. You are being made converted, saved, and made righteous with and through other people. Proper gratitude shows us that God has done this for us, by the way, through other people. Proper gratitude says, makes us feel smaller, not bigger. The disciples, uh, the Pharisees' gratitude made them feel like, look how big I am. I'm so much bigger than everybody else. Real gratitude makes you realize, oh, I didn't make that on my own. There was an entire group of people supporting me, and there was God doing this, and there were friends, and there was my social situation, there were my opportunities, and maybe, dare we say, a little fortunate circumstances or luck. And the more we realize this, the smaller we get, and that's okay. We don't need to be big. Proper gratitude makes us smaller. The, the Pharisee's gratitude made him bigger. This is always a danger. We want the kind of gratitude that makes us feel smaller and more collect, connected, not more isolated. My friends, this can't be done alone. I don't know if you know that. I'm a Christian who doesn't go to church. Then you're not a Christian. You're not. You're following Jesus. Are you saved? Sure. Are you going to heaven? Absolutely. If it's up to me, sure. But are you a Christian? No. Little Christs are connected with other people, doing life with other people, rubbing up against other people, having the complexity of trying to have relationships with people we disagree with. That's what it is to be a Christian, a little Christ. Because what is Christ doing? He's reconciling the entire universe to God. It's connect. He's reconnecting everything, not disconnecting things. To be little Christians is to be connected. It is the rare, it is the myth that there is this rare Christian loner that's figured it out by themselves, alone on an island. It's, it's a myth. It's a myth. It's a fake story. Christianity is never something done alone. And this is absolutely done with our brothers and sisters with whom you are grateful and this is absolutely done with our brothers and sisters, whom you are grateful you are not. Because those you're grateful you're not, have, you've never included into your conversion. You've said there's no way they can participate in what God is doing in my life. So they need to be outside on the edges, praying by themselves. I am saying that through other people, the more different people and the more different kinds of people that are participating in your conversion is the more full your conversion that God is doing for your life. By the way, I'm not sure about that. I work out my theology in public. I'm working on that. My goal as a sermon, by the way, is not to complete your information, it's to get you talking. So if this week you argue with Greg, I've done my job. Or Amanda, email Amanda. She's on vacation. She'll read it later. It'll be fine. My conversion is so much better to the person of God, to a Christian, because I knew Mick and Randy and Victoria, my homeless friends here in Turlock. My conversion is so much deeper because a man named Chris Simning who has torsal dystonia, who can't move barely at all, but he's a public speaker, whose voice is slurred, told me I live the full life of God. And my brain said, no, you do not, because you are not able-bodied. And I'm like, where did that come from? Where did that come from? And I confessed it to him. And he goes, that's what everybody thinks, and you're wrong. And I'm a different man because of Chris Simning. That he told me, you are wrong, Jeremiah. 
you're missing what God is doing. And I converted. Gratitude we have today is a gratitude for those who have participated in our conversions. Think back. Who has made you who you are today? Who has brought you to this place? I bet there's been a lot of different people. I bet there's been people that stretched you, family, aunts, uncles, church members, maybe arguments, maybe discussions. Maybe you got to know someone and then you found out they were gay and you're like, oh, but they're neat and they're gay. I'm so confused. Welcome. Because relationships, did you know that relationships complicated God's life? It did. God, didn't have, God would never have died on a cross if we hadn't been made. We complicated God's life. Other relationships should complicate your life. If your life is simple, oh, my friends, you need new friends. Just meet a Democrat or a Republican, whichever side you're opposite of. Go have dinner. That'll complicate it. You'll have a good start. <laughs> Gratitude that I have is for those who've been in my experience, not those I look away from. When I hear my mind go, I'm grateful I'm not that person, that's me now, God telling me, look at you, self-righteous. Not in a mean way, but in a kind, loving way. Jeremiah, what are you doing? What are you doing? Time to convert, time to convert, time to convert. This requires something, by the way, admitting you were biased. This requires something, admitting that you were a little self-righteous. Admitting maybe you didn't get here on your own as much as you've told the story that you did. Admitting you're not better or more open-minded than everyone else here. You're not. You and I are biased. All of us are. And that bias represents self-righteousness. And I love it. I didn't tell Greg the end of this sermon. This is the words I put down. We'll give credit to the Holy Spirit. As we spoke earlier, what are the words the man says? Lord, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. This is the correct posture. When we see our self-righteousness, we go, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. As we repeated together earlier, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. A sinner, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Father, have mercy on us. We are sinners. Amen.